All right, hello everyone, how are you doing today? Okay, well I'm not going to do that thing where I say, I, you can do better than that, how are we doing today? No. Oh, okay, hey, it worked anyway, see? I conned you already. <laughs> All right, my name is Master Chen, or Nick Rosario, and today I'll be talking about what I learned as a con artist. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, I guess we could start by uh, letting you know who I am. I am a Chen of all trades and a master of nothingness. It's kind of like a Zen thing that I have going on. Uh, it's really hard to do, actually. We could talk about that later. <laughs> um, I got started in sales and martial arts. So I used to run my own martial arts school. And so I'd have to you know, find new clients, sign up new people. And this is where I learned a lot about sales, about talking to people, about social interaction. Um, and just getting to know people and getting inside their heads. And from there, I went on to getting a psychology degree, or I'm working on getting a psychology degree uh, next uh, next fall. So uh, I also like to hack VoIP, uh, asterisk specifically. Uh, you might have seen me in 2600. Uh, these are the two articles dealing with VoIP in 2600. And so that's just a little bit of who I am. Um, I'm currently a gaming surveillance operator at uh, MGM, specifically New York, New York. And there, I also learn a lot about body language as well. Uh, catch uh, blackjack cheaters, <laughs> um, people who like to cap bets or try to sneak in uh, illegal cheating tools. That's what I look out for. And so that's pretty much what I'm doing now. All right, so what makes a con successful? Well, I believe that you have four things to make a con successful. You need to know your mark. And we'll get into what a mark is in a second. You need to know your mark. You need to have information flow control, which means uh, to have every aspect of what you're doing controlled by you. Uh, plan B, all, all the way to plan Z. Uh, you need patience. You need to relax. You need patience, because it'll all come down. Uh, con stands for confidence. So you need confidence in yourself. And you also need to have their confidence in you as well. Um, now, you might be wondering about the picture up here. Uh, I actually didn't start working for MGM until 2012. Um, but I snuck into the holiday party at uh, in 2007. <laughs> so you'll see me there on the right, and then my cousin in the middle, and then uh, my best friend on the left. Or I think that's your left. That's your right. <laughs> um, we actually snuck in just because we were decently dressed, and they didn't card us or anything. So it was that simple. And, and that's the thing that I want to talk about today is that conning is very simple. You don't have to run a Ponzi scheme. Even though I, I never have, I think I could with the right amount of tools and resources. Um, and so we'll move on from there. So before we get into some of my examples today, uh, we're going to talk about useful terms. Uh, the first one is the mark. You might have heard this in watching TV, uh, like Leverage or some of my favorite uh, TV shows, White Collar. The mark is basically your target, uh, the person who has the assets that you want to grab. Okay, the play is uh, your plan, your plan of action, what you're going to do to con the person out of those assets. Uh, the shill is actually the person who is in on the con, but they look like they're just some average Joe Blow part of the uh, part of the audience. So I might have a shill in here too. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, so these are not my examples, but these are classic examples of cons. You might know these. Uh, you have the three card Monty, also known as the shell game or the card game, where you're looking for the queen among three uh, among three playing cards. Uh, now, what makes this con successful is that you have the shell who's in the audience pretending to look for the queen or the the shell under the cup, uh, you know, uh, under the cup, and so they'll they'll conspire with the mark when really they're conspiring with the con or the dealer. And actually, I see this a lot on the Vegas Strip. Uh, the cops bust them all the time. They pull out their uh, fold-out tables, and they do like a really quick three-card Monty. And when they see the cops coming, they'll run, you know? <laughs> I see it every day. Well, I used to. Uh, they don't play so much at night, you know, like three in the morning. Uh, OK, so the second one is called Pig in a Poke. And basically, what you're doing is here, you're, you're showing off uh, a set of merchandise. And then when the person buys your merchandise, you give them something that's of lesser quality. So you, you maybe show them like a, like a coach bag or a Louis Vuitton. And then the package that you give them is not of the same quality. And so that's what you call a pig in a poke. Uh, you might have other examples in your head, maybe, or you might have heard this before. But that's what I think of when I think of this con. Uh, the third one is the bait and switch. This is also another classic con. Uh, it's similar to number two, the pig in a poke, but it deals with uh, advertising method. So the advertisement gets you into the door. 
And then after that, they'll take that deal away and give you something else that's either of lesser value or just something that they wanted from you in the first place. So uh, I actually have an example of the pig and a poke. Or not pig and a poke, I'm sorry. Um, the bait and switch. Yeah, there you go. One second. Well, I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, I guess you'll have to decide. <laughs> All right, so this is a classic bait and switch. Okay, so you see, you see what's supposed to happen. The dumbass puts on the blindfold, they switch. And <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that is your example of the bait and switch. <laughs> so when you're finding a potential mark, there, there's a couple of things that you got to keep in mind. Uh, every person, every single person in this room, every single person that you come across is motivated by something. That something could be anything, money, power, uh, religion, lack of religion, family, friends, it's all there. Um, people want to be recognized. Uh, maybe you guys want to be recognized for the software that you write or that you don't write. Um, <laughs> and you can also have, um, motivation can also be gender specific. Uh, women tend to be uh, motivated by other things than, than men. And I'm not trying to put people in a, in a gender box, but uh, there are some things that you can look for uh, when it comes to gender. Um, so what you're, you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find that motivation and be that solution. You're trying to be that answer. And you do that by talking to somebody, uh, grabbing on their body language, uh, paying attention to what they say, what they do, how they say it. And you'll notice that when they're really motivated by something, you'll, you'll hear it in their voice. You'll hear it in the way that they talk about the subject that really interests them. And so again, your goal is to be that solution, be that answer. You want to be the way that they can have their dreams accomplished. So in a con, while the con is going on, uh, how do you keep control? Uh, what I learned in sales is that you keep control by asking questions. You ask questions and it forces them to answer. And you, you might have heard it before, you ask open-ended questions, not simply yes or no questions, but just uh, questions that force them to explain their issue, force them to explain their mindset, force them to explain what it is that they want. And uh, along with that, you have to speak less and listen more. So awkward silences uh, usually give them the feeling that they need to explain something. So let them explain. Let them just keep talking until they tell you everything that you need to know. And uh, the third one, I wish I brought my towel with me, is don't panic. <laughs> Okay, so example number one, uh, this goes back to high school, or I, I, yeah, I'd say high school, freshman year. <laughs> I think that uh, is past the statute of limitations. Um, so the example is the guys have diaries too. Basically, my mark was a girl that I used to have a crush on, um, but she didn't have a crush on me back, so fuck her. <laughs> she actually had a crush on my best friend uh, at the time, and I was like, well, shit. <laughs> So I told her, and Mark was infatuated with my, my best friend. She just was head over heels about him. She wanted to know everything about him. And she had these delusions of mutual affection. Now, to her defense, maybe he let her on a little bit. But in any case, I saw an opening to maybe get even. I was immature at the time. Whatever. So um, she wanted to know why he seemed distant. She wanted to know what was on his mind. Well... I was the solution. I said, yeah, well, he actually keeps a journal and for some reason he shares it with me. So here, open this file. It's called journal.bat. Uh, now back then, I believe this was Windows 98 uh, SE. So the way I wrote the bat file was uh, it deleted all other bat files, uh, batch files in the system. So the computer wasn't bootable afterwards. <laughs> uh, she actually paid Geek Squad too, or whatever was out there at the time. I think it was through Best Buy, though. OK, well, the example, too, is uh, a lot of my sales tricks that I used to use when uh, getting new students for my martial arts school. 
Um, the first one I call uh, respect the non-present authority. So basically, if I'm talking to somebody about signing up for classes and they're kind of on the fence about signing up, I would say, okay, well, let me see if I can work a deal out for you. So I would call up some random other martial arts school, or not uh, another martial arts school, but somebody that's affiliated with me, like maybe a, uh, a colleague or whatnot, and I call them and say, hey, you know, I got this nice uh, couple here who wants to sign up their uh, five-year-old daughter for self-defense classes, but they're a little, they're a little uh, on the fence about signing up. I was wondering if we could work a deal out with them. And, you know, they'd, they'd catch on really quickly because they'd probably be using the same tricks. Um, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, well, instead of X amount of dollars a month, let's, let's go ahead and give them $50 a month and they could do all the group classes and private lessons. No, no problem. Give them that deal. Uh, so that was the plan originally. Really, we just wanted that money out of you, you know. Um, so that's how we got it. <laughs> the, when I say non-present authority, it's easy to say no to the person who's sitting across from you. It's not so easy to say no to the person who's not present, who's not there. Uh, think about like Mr. Big or maybe like deal or no deal. At least that's what comes to mind for me. Uh, the second one is actually my favorite example when it comes to sale, uh, sales. I call it the sealed envelope. So again, uh, you have somebody who's on the fence about signing up for classes. And what you would do is, or what I would do, is I would say, okay, I'll tell you what. I would, I'd invite you to go ahead and shop around, talk to other martial arts schools, uh, see if you can get a better price. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my business card and I'm going to write the price on the back of the business card. I'm going to put it in this envelope and I'm going to seal it. And I'll keep it sealed. You know, you'll initial on it and we'll keep it sealed. And if you find a price better, come back and I guarantee that I'll be a better price. No matter where you go, no matter where you go, in state, out of state, I will always be the better price. I guarantee it. So what this does is they'll leave. Now, if they sign up for me, uh, if they sign up with me or not, is not the point. The point is that I want them to come back so that I can either have a second chance at talking to them again or just to prove that I can get them back. And this worked probably about four times out of five. <laughs> so they'd come back and then they'd just be interested in, you know, what happened with the sealed envelope. And I'd say, okay, well, let's open it together. So we opened the sealed envelope and I wish I had a picture of it. But basically on the back of the business card, I wrote $5 less than where you went. <laughs> But it brought them back. It brought them back so that I can talk to them again and maybe have a second chance at selling on them. So uh, the last one is uh, what I don't like to do cold calling. I hate it. I really do hate it. I hate bothering people at home. I hate just picking a number out of a phone book. So what I would do instead was I'd, I'd stand outside by the grocery store handing out uh, passes, uh, you know, for free weeks of martial arts, maybe a free month or whatever. Uh, when I first started this, I was about 16 years old. and I got rejected a lot. I mean, a shitload. <laughs> I'd hand up the, the pass and they'd hand it right back. It was almost like playing a trading card game with my own cards. So I figured they're saying no to me and I can't take that personally. So how do I make them not say no to me? So what I do is I just say, I was asked to give this to you. <laughs> so now they're not saying no to me and they're actually, they actually feel more obliged to take it. So even if they're not going to sign up with me, they took the merchandise. Um, maybe they'll think about it later, but the point is that it got them the propaganda, it got them the marketing out there. So again, I say, hey, I was asked to give this to you and uh, they take it and they, they don't give it back. <laughs> so that's another example. All right, now example number three is actually uh, my favorite example out of all of the examples that I have because uh, it's the most uh, intricate. It's the most, uh, in my opinion, well thought out uh, con that I did. Uh, maybe I shouldn't admit to anything here. Um, but let's see. So the, the mark was persistent. Uh, I guess I should do a little bit of a backstory here. Um, my cousin is a nurse, and she has another nurse friend who was dating a doctor. Well, you know how that goes. Uh, employee relations doesn't really end well all the time. So the, she had suspicions of the doctor kind of not playing nice and emailing people that could influence her career. So she, she thought that the doctor was sabotaging her career by emailing people saying, you know, don't, don't hire this person, don't, uh, don't continue her promotion and, and whatnot. So she wanted proof. She wanted proof that there was uh, correspondence in his email. Uh, and so she came to me thinking that I was a hacker for hire. Now, yes, I'd like to be hack, uh, I'd like to be hired for uh, an information security firm, but I'm not a mercenary. But maybe I can make it look like I did something. <laughs> so 
I needed it to look like I like I hacked into the doctor's email. I'm not going to hack into a doctor's email. I just I don't do that. Uh, so what do I do? Uh, well, I told her I, it would take a little bit of time. I told her that you know, give me a week or two. I'll I'll keep you updated. I'll let you know how it goes. And actually, the waiting game helps out too because it gets her to be antsy. It gets the mark to be um, anxious, and that actually plays into getting the results that you want. So I made her wait for a little bit. Um, I told her that I was working really hard, and I could have showed her screenshots of the command prompt or, you know, whatever they do. <laughs> now, I didn't do all that, but what I did was, on the last day where I said I'd have it done, she asked me for an update, and I said, oh, shit, I really didn't have anything planned. <laughs> but I said, okay, it just needs to look like I've hacked into the doctor's email. So I sent her a spoofed email using Netcat with nothing but, uh, uh, nothing's in here. There's no evidence of, uh, of anything. And she accepted it. She accepted that as, as fact. As, you know, oh, well, he hacked into an email, and uh, there's nothing there, no evidence, so I guess, uh, I guess the doctor's honest. Probably about as honest as I am. <laughs> uh, and so that, that's how that turned out. And she even paid me for it. And, and it's, it's been so successful that she was actually at my house two days ago uh, so that I could fix her computer. <laughs> And that's another thing about conning somebody. You know you've done it right when they have no idea that they've been conned. So hopefully nobody sees, or hopefully she specifically doesn't see this on YouTube later. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's at the end of one friendship. <laughs> now the point, and now why am I talking to you guys about this? Uh, you guys are in the information security field. Uh, but I say that hackers can be conned too. Maybe by me, maybe not by me. The point though is going back to the first lesson, Everybody is motivated by something. What is that something for you? Are you motivated by uh, career path, uh, software and design recognition, uh, new technology? Did you want to get your hands on new technology? Re uh, plea bargains if you're maybe in trouble. How do we con you guys into doing things that you might not normally want to do? And so this is more of a rhetorical question for you guys. It's a little bit of introspection. My point is just everybody can be conned one way or another. Find the motivation and be that answer. And, th and that's really my bottom line. So again, here's uh, some of my recurring lessons. Every single person is motivated by something. <laughs> Fix it, know it, use it, be it, technologic. <laughs> well, I had that song in my head, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know if I explained it correctly in my examples, but the second point is very important too. Information flow control at every point. So think about like a man in the middle. You control what the mark sees, you control what the mark doesn't see, you control when they see it, you control how they see it. And that's what makes a con successful. Uh, really, that's it, is that you control every aspect of information. Maybe you call it a smoke screen, again, man in the middle, however you want to term it, but that's, that's what it is. Um, and what makes conning somebody really successful is that people want to see results, so much so that they might ignore their skeptical or critical side. So why do we go to magic shows? We go to magic shows knowing that we're going to be deceived. So automatically going to, like, let's say, Penn & Teller or uh, Chris Angel, which really isn't a magic show, by the way. <laughs> it's a Cirque du Soleil show with a whole bunch of flipping, uh, just in case you guys are interested. Uh, don't go to that one. <laughs> I would suggest O or maybe Zumanity. Per professional experience, so. Um, but yeah, so why do we go to a magic show? Because we want to be deceived. We want to be conned or deceived in a way. We, we, want, to, we want to see that illusion. But the point is, you don't have to go to a magic show to be deceived. You go to a magic show expecting to be deceived. But where else are you deceived that you don't expect it? You know? Uh, sales, maybe. Maybe, but you also have what's called swindling. What's the difference between swindling and sales? Well, with sales, you actually get a product in return, a product or service in return, swindling or conning. You give them the money, and they walk. They sell you snake oil, and they leave. And then you call up saying, where the fuck are you? <laughs> and they're nowhere to be found. They're, they've closed up shop, and they're out. So uh, these were my references. Uh, the one on the left is called Mind Manipulation by Dr. Ha Ha Lung. Oh, formatting got messed up. It's okay. And then the, the one on the right is a, probably a more familiar book for this community, the social engineering book. So uh, that's pretty much uh, what I have. So.
and uh, I, I do believe I have quite a bit of time for uh, for questions. So, if you have any. Uh, I would say that there are similarities, but the thing with, uh, you got to remember that uh, a con is basically a, a confidence game. So you're relying on uh, a product or service or a promise, and in the end, you don't get it. So if you're trying to turn somebody, like as an example, you're trying to turn a double agent or, or whatnot, you have to promise something that at least they believe they're going to get. Uh, and that's, that's probably where there's a little similarity and maybe a little bit of difference there as well. So I, I actually don't work in law enforcement, although with gaming surveillance, uh, I do see the FBI quite a bit. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, cool. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. And actually, as long as I don't name names, I have, uh, I have leeway with what I can talk about. <laughs> um, a lot of my job is about uh, catching card counters, so while I'm watching them play, I'm actually counting the cards down with them. Um, and that's really the easy part of the job. The hardest part of the job is trying to catch somebody who's using a device to help you, or to help them win the game. So what I'm saying here is, uh, and I don't condone card counting, but I'm going to tell you right now that it's not illegal. So if you do it, the worst thing that's going to happen to you is that you're going to be kicked off a of property or at least barred from the table. They won't let you play blackjack anymore. So if you want to count cards, you didn't hear from me, but it's not illegal. Uh, but what is illegal is using devices to help you. So if you have a card counting app on, like, let's say, your iPhone, uh, I don't know the specific name of it, but there's one where if it's a high count, you tap the top of the touch screen, and you, you, they usually have it on their lap. And if you if it's a low count, you tap the low part of the, the touch screen, and then it lowers the counts for you, and then it'll vibrate according to how you should bet. It's actually pretty sophisticated. Uh, I'm an Android guy, so fuck that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as far as specific stories, ah, God, uh, hookers. <laughs> oh, hookers are, are pros at the con game, by the way. <laughs> they they do what's called they do what's called trick roll. Have you guys ever heard of trick roll? <laughs> okay, with well, the trick roll, basically they say, hey, let's go upstairs and uh, you know let's have some fun. Uh, just give me two hundred dollars. Up front, dumbasses. <laughs> so they go upstairs, and while the dude has his pants around his ankles, they grab the wallet, the Rolex, the money, and they're out. And they're out quickly. I mean, screeching out of the parking lot, or they get picked up on the side of the, of the casino. It's ridiculous. But you learn a lot from them. <laughs> um, another thing that I've learned, too, though, is that, <laughs> well, I haven't learned how to prostitute myself, but what... <laughs> But I've learned how to, you know, I've learned what to look for. And speaking of which, uh, I've also learned something that's kind of a side note, not really about conning, but if you ever see two people get into a fight, I found this really interesting, which is why I'm sharing it. If you see two people get into a fight, uh, and from the surveillance equipment, one of them starts walking away, stick with the person that's not walking away. Stick with the person, keep an eye on the person that's standing there. Because nine times out of ten, the person who walked away is not done fighting, and they'll come back. They'll come back to argue more and start more drama. So that, to me, I found that kind of interesting. It's a good uh, way to analyze body language and, and going down that path. So, uh, any other questions about anything? Uh, <laughs> absolutely. You know, uh, after my time, we can definitely uh, talk a lot more. So, uh, you had a question, though, sir? Uh, Shaolin martial arts, Shaolin Kempo. Um, I don't know if you saw the penguin. I love Tux, and I put uh, the Shaolin characters on his stomach. I love uh, the monks. I actually trained with them uh, in China in 2006 for about two weeks. And then uh, we actually have an exchange where we go out there every other year, and every other year they come here. We fly them out here to train with them uh, once a year per, uh, every summer. So that's kind of cool. So I train with the monks, and then I go to DEF CON, or B-Sides. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, actually, here's a little bit of Vegas history. Uh, we don't have that anymore. <laughs> but I will tell you that the last mob-owned casino was the Stardust. Uh, everything nowadays is corporate. Uh, so you, you have two major players on the strip. You have Caesars Entertainment, which is where Black Hat is, and then you have MGM, uh, which owns the other half of the strip. 
So, uh, like I said, I work for MGM, and I'm at New York, New York specifically. Um, by the way, I'm not working tonight, so if you go there and count cards, it's not my fault. <laughs> But I have other people who are watching. <laughs> um, but you have MGM, I'm not going to name them all, but you have MGM, Aria, uh, New York, New York, Mandalay Bay, they're all part of the same company. And then you have Caesars Entertainment, which is also part of Harris, I believe. So you have Caesars, um, uh, Venetian, yeah, exactly. So that, that's, I find that interesting. But no, no, to answer your question, no more, no more uh, hammers, no more rubber mallets or anything. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes. Of course. <laughs> uh, maybe this should have been an underground. Uh, maybe should, this should have been an underground talk. <laughs> but this was my first uh, speech, so I submitted to uh, proving grounds. Uh, as long as you're promising something that you can deliver, it then becomes more of like a contract situation where you have um, consideration and acceptance. And I took a course on tort law, so that's just something that I remembered. Uh, but uh, that would be something that makes it somewhat legal, but don't quote me on that because you are still conning somebody out of something. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Yes, used car sales, I would say that's a con game. I really would. Because they're promising something, and then, it, in my experience, it's subpar. It's not really what they're promising, and it's legal. So, yes, that, that's, your, that's your example, used car sales. Uh, <laughs> well... Sure. <laughs> Any other questions, or you know, we can talk after as well. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, for the for the example of the nurse, the example or. Um, she was already desperate. She came to me because she wanted to know the answer so bad. Why, why, why? That's usually questions that you get. Why, why did he do this to me? Or, you know. And so that's really their motivation. As far as determining somebody's motivation or determining somebody's reason of, of, of asking something, uh, you just ask the right questions. Uh, you, you sit them down and you talk to them face to face. Face to face is the best way, by the way. Um, I know that a lot of social engineering can be done with the phone, but what I do is when I talk to somebody face to face, I can pick up on their facial uh, expressions, their micro, um, micro expressions, body language, and things like this. And then from there, I can see maybe what what they're not telling me verbally. They're telling me uh, in another way. Um, as far as a specific example, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, but if you give me a couple of minutes, I'm sure I could pull out something from my head. Now, whether I'm lying to you or not, you'll have to decide. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, you, you, you did. You did kind of make me feel but. I am very sociopathic. <laughs> no, I, I, I do feel a little bit of remorse, but the same question is, would I feel worse hacking into a doctor's email, potentially violating HIPAA or some other regulation that I don't know about, and then you know potentially really getting myself into a lot more trouble? Uh, and maybe I am doing this in a way of self-preservation, but at the same time, I'm kind of looking at the lesser of two evils. Um, and if you really look at her motivation, she wants to know Okay. <laughs> she wants to know what happened or maybe why it happened and that's all she needs to know. She didn't she didn't need to retaliate. She didn't need to uh cause any damage on his end. She just needed confidence and the satisfaction that there was nothing there or at least the Well, looking back, see, and, and that's another thing, we still talk, and that, that's a good question, but she's actually going for her MCAT in about three weeks, and uh, her career seems fine to me, so, well, yes, to me. <laughs> well, here, here's another thing, too. I am not as leet as everybody who, who knows me thinks I am. Uh, 
and, and that's okay. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit that. But I mean, you just talk about going to DEF CON and everybody's like, holy shit, he's a hacker. You know, and so they say, well, can you do this? Can you do that? Or they see a movie and they're like, well, can you do this? And can you do that? And really, that's how she approached me is I heard you really this and that. Can you do this and that? And I said, well, we could try. <laughs> so uh, I think I'm out of time, but uh, I can answer any of the questions right outside. I have no time limit, so.